Preseason? What's a preseason? Your Locked on the New York Rangers, your daily podcast on the New York Rangers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, Blue Shirts fans, to episode number 918 of the Locked On New York Rangers podcast. I'm your host, John Chick. I just want to thank you guys, as always, for making Locked On New York Rangers your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. And today's episode of Locked On New York Rangers is brought to you by Jace Medical. Empower yourself when you purchase a Jace case providing you with a personal supply of five antibiotics that treat 50-plus infections. Get yours today at jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com. And we are, of course, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So let's go ahead and uh, just kind of bask in the afterglow of a really, really solid, great, outstanding opening night win in Buffalo for the New York Rangers. They go in there to play a rapidly improving Sabres team, but they pretty much controlled the entire game and they go on to post a 5-1 to victory. And, you know, as far as opening night performances are concerned, especially after what was a kind of a rough preseason that saw the Rangers struggle at times, go 1-5, uh, certain nights just seem, didn't seem like they had a lot of jump in their game. Hopefully this will have Ranger fans feeling better. I know I feel better, kind of alleviate some of the concerns. It is only one game. Don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves here. But as far as an opening night, uh, game, especially one on the road, I don't think it really could have gone a whole lot better than that game that we just watched last night. We got strong team defense, a uh, big night for Chris Kreider, uh, Igor Shosturkin doing Igor Shosturkin things as he's known to do. i um, also going to be pointing the spotlight at some of the uh, other newest New York Rangers on the team. So we got a lot to do today, but I want to kick things off uh, with the second line, which was, of course, Panarin. Heedle and Lafreniere, specifically Alexi Lafreniere, thought he had an outstanding game, uh, and that line in general played very, very well together, and you got to figure, uh, even just based on this one game against the Sabres here, that line probably just got itself a decent amount of rope going forward. Um, I, I think you could probably say that of just about all the Ranger line combinations. We'll, we'll talk about that, you know, in the coming episodes here as far as tweaks to the lineup or whatever kind of... Uh, shuffling of the deck there could be, but hopefully there's not much of that because, like I said, this is a very complete win. Everybody contributed, and specifically this second line here. Got to start there. So uh, Lafreniere, very strong game. I thought he should have had a goal and an assist. I, I guess on the assist, it looked more like, you know, maybe the, the Sabres player was trying to get the puck away from Lafreniere and accidentally got it right to Panarin, but uh, Lafreniere still made that happen. But getting ahead of myself a little bit, Lafreniere's day kind of began. The first thing of note happened uh, in the morning, during the morning skate, there were some pictures popping up on social media from some of the reporters that are there in the building uh, while the Rangers were going through, once again, their morning skate. Uh, there was, I don't know if it was at, like at the end of the session or right in the middle of it, not really sure, but at one time or another, uh, there were pictures of Laviolette and Lafreniere, the two of them kind of near the bench, just talking one-on-one. -on -one. And, you know, apparently I'm just going by what was posted on social media. Uh, just a lot of nodding from Alexi Lafreniere. So uh, it seemed like one of those things where Laviolette, I mean, it wasn't a bad conversation at all. If anything, he was kind of pumping him up a little bit, giving him some words of encouragement. And you just like to think that Lafreniere got the message. And if the way he played in this game is any indication, it would certainly seem uh, like that was indeed the case. I tweeted out uh, during the morning yesterday, obviously hours before this game was going to start, uh, I, I wrote, what if Lafreniere just goes off for four points? And he didn't quite get there, obviously. Well, I mean, he ends up with just the one goal. Again, I, I thought it should have been a goal and an assist. But I don't know, just had a, a good feeling that for one reason or another, it just kind of hit me in the morning that I, I think Lafreniere is going to play a good game in this one. And he did. Um, we might as well go ahead and talk about his goal, the first Ranger goal of the season. You've got, well, first of all, uh, the the instance before Lafreniere's goal was the same shift, but uh, once again, this line of Panarin and Hedl and Lafreniere pretty much just buzzing all night, and they had an outstanding uh, scoring opportunity on their second shift here, and then ultimately they did score on their second shift. As far as kind of the, the near miss here, you had Panarin leading Lafreniere up the right side of the rink. Uh, Lafreniere then with a pass back to his left to Philip Hedl, looking for the tip-in try on the doorstep. It was denied, uh, but they ended up going right back into the Sabre zone, and it was the result of some really, really strong neutral zone play for the Rangers uh, on this uh, play here. And that was kind of a theme for the entire night. Really good play 
good defensive play uh, by the Rangers in the neutral zone. And in a couple of cases, that strong defensive play in the neutral zone led to some chances. And in a couple of cases, uh, some goals for the Rangers as well. But basically, uh, the Sabres, you know, get the puck out of their zone. They're in the neutral zone. You've got this entire line plus Adam Fox all applying pressure in the neutral zone. Sabres had no room to breathe. Um, all three forwards, once again, Lafreniere, Hedo, Panarin, they're all pressuring the puck. Adam Fox, like I said, he was in there uh, as well. Philip Hedo ends up coming away with the puck. Very short pass ahead uh, to lead Artemi Panarin over the blue line into the attacking zone. Panarin takes a shot from kind of near the top of the right circle. Wasn't quite there, but, you know, in that vicinity. And the save was made, but Panarin charging the net, gets to his own rebound, and everybody's going toward Panarin. Obviously, he commands a lot of attention out there. And what does Panarin do? Slides a really nice pass uh, back to his left to Alexi Lafreniere, who knocks it in from the doorstep. Lafreniere was fired up. He said, let's something go. Uh, you can you can fill in the blank there. I don't want to do it because I, I do like hosting this podcast. Uh, but that obviously gave the Rangers a one to nothing lead. Uh, really great start there. And for Lafreniere, you know, they interviewed him after the game. And, you know, he kind of downplayed the goal and everything. And he was really putting his teammates over. It was, it was a lot of we talk instead of me talk, which is great to see as well. But you've got to believe, man. He, some of the starts that he's gotten off to in some of these seasons, uh, you know, his rookie season really jumps out. He had, uh, he went like 15 games before he finally got his first goal which ironically was in this very same building because it was an overtime winner uh, at Buffalo. But yeah, for him to get the first goal of the season and, and just get that first one out of the way, that's got to feel good. That, that's got to be uh, some weight off of his shoulders. Obviously, there's a, a lot of work still to be done here, but I, I got to think, you know, a lot of guys really want to get that first goal, that first assist, that first point out of the way, especially when you're kind of under the microscope as Lafreniere is right now. So that was awesome to see him get this goal. Again, just really hard work by this entire line. You can throw Adam Fox in there too. Uh, great neutral zone play, and it leads to the Rangers' first goal of the season. Uh, not too long after this, we had Lafreniere in the second period. Really nasty move on the doorstep. This is what I was talking about in the preseason where, you know, my biggest concern from for Lafreniere is that we just don't see enough of those wow plays. You know, every now and then, you know, he'll, he'll break one out. He had those goals, uh, one last year, one the year before, where he played the puck through his own legs to himself and then roofed a backhander. So it is in there, but really nice stick handling on the doorstep here. He was moving toward the net. Um, this is the second period. He's on the right side of the net and tried to look like go top shelf there and roof it. Um, Devon Levy, who was in goal for the Sabres, just made a better save. But a good opportunity there for Lafreniere. And uh, nice to see him drive to the net and, uh, you know, try to score. He had a chance. Again, it was just a, a little bit better of a save. Um, and then not too long after that, two on one for Lafreniere and Hedl. Lafreniere tried to get the puck over to Hedl. Just missed it. Uh, the Sabre defenseman just barely got his stick on it. Deflects out of play. And so that uh, opportunity was thwarted. But again, Lafreniere just playing very well. And another huge play here on the Rangers' Uh, third goal. This made it three to nothing uh, in favor of our beloved blue shirts here. But uh, basically, the puck is in the Ranger zone. You've got Eric Gustafson, who I thought had a, a very nice game overall. You know, one or two hiccups maybe, but we're going to talk about all the new Ranger players in due time here. Uh, but Gustafson moves the puck out of the Ranger zone into the neutral zone. Lafreniere is playing with his head on fire here. He's getting in his opponent's face, who has the puck, just being a complete pest, uh, trying to get the puck away from him, just working, you know, fighting like his life was on the line here to get this puck. And I thought, you know, watching it live that he eventually got the puck and then passed over to Panarin. Panarin then took the puck uh, to the net, shot and scored. That made it three to nothing. Uh, I guess, you know, watching the replay a couple of times, it does look like the Sabre basically panicked and, um, you know, try to get the puck away from Lafreniere. I don't know if he thought he had a teammate over there or what, but basically pass it right to Artemi Panarin. I mean, Lafreniere couldn't have made a better pass on this uh, if, if he was the one that came over with the puck. So Lafreniere does not get an official assist on this play, but we'll give him an, an unofficial assist. Uh, this goal does not happen without Lafreniere, you know, playing his tail off during this shift, pressuring the puck, and uh, basically making his opponent panic and give the puck away to Artemi Panarin, which is not something that you ever want to do if you're playing the New York Rangers. Big night for Panarin, too. You know, I talked about wasn't just Lafreniere. This whole line was outstanding. Uh, Panarin ends up with a goal and an assist. There, there's so many games where, you know, Panarin, he just ends up with two points just because that's what he does, you know? Like, it, it's amazing how naturally, you know, producing points seems to come from it, from him. Um, but he ends up with a goal. He ends up with an assist. And, um, you know, the goal that he scored there was great. And I'm really happy that he didn't really have the opportunity to pass the puck on that play because we know Panarin can be a little bit pass happy. And I saw some people on Twitter kind of speculating that maybe LaViolette is telling Panarin to shoot the puck more. And maybe he is. Uh, the, the goal by Lafreniere 
was the result of Panarin shooting, getting his own rebound and getting it to Lafreniere. And then here, of course, he chooses to shoot as well. On this one, though, he didn't really have a choice because he was in by himself. Um, there weren't really any Rangers all that close to him. So he had to shoot and he scored. And I've been saying this and saying this. I'm all for uh, Artemi Panarin shooting the puck a little bit more often. He's a phenomenal passer, but he's got a nasty shot too, a very accurate shot. And um, if he plays a little bit, just a little bit more selfish, I, I think you'll see his goals uh, really go up this season. So nice to see him, uh, you know, bouncing back from, man, that had to be a long off season for Artemi Panarin. I know Ranger fans were down on him, uh, but he really took it on the chin following that playoff series against the Devils and, um, you know, said all the right things. He, he wore it. He didn't make any excuses. And uh, nice to see him come back with a strong game in the season debut. I, I know a lot of people are going to, with Panarin, almost sort of be looking ahead, you know, to the playoffs. Well, what's he going to do in the playoffs? And again, Panarin has had some good playoff runs. Last year was not one of them, uh, but a nice start for him here. And, you know, as far as the playoffs and Panarin is concerned, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Rangers have to qualify first. And, hey, there's one down and one to go. So that's quite a ways uh, in the future here. But nice to see Panarin uh, playing well in this game. And apparently this line uh, outshot Buffalo 10 to one while it was on the ice, which I was not aware of as the game was happening. It's not like I was, you know, keeping track of every single shot that this line produced, but you hear that stat after the game's over and it's kind of like, yeah, that sounds about right. They were creating opportunities every time they were on the ice, they were buzzing, seemed to have good chemistry together and um, felt like the entire time they were on the ice, the puck was in Buffalo's, you know, side of the rink. So uh, good to see there. And, and just a fantastic game for the second line for the Rangers. And you hope, that this, you know, buys them some more time together, gives them some more rope. I mean, I don't know why you would change any of the line combinations uh, after a game like this. So just good stuff all around. And uh, I'm going to keep everything going here. We're just scratching the surface of all the things that the Rangers did well in this game. I want to just, uh, just a second here, turn our attention to some of the Ranger neutral zone play and also give some props to Igor Shesterkin, uh, who had a nice game as well. And we're going to do that in just a second. First, though, Gotta let everybody know today's episode of Locked On New York Rangers is brought to you by Jace Case. Everyone should be empowered to care for themselves and their loved ones during the unexpected. That's why Jace Medical offers the Jace Case. The Jace Case provides five life-saving antibiotics for emergency use and gives you peace of mind so that you are not just hoping that you have access to medication in an emergency. Jace Medical, make sure you have the medication in hand. Jace Medical is simple. They handle everything from online evaluation to Lysis Pharmacy medication delivery and ongoing consultation and care. Do not get caught unprepared. Get $20 off on these life-saving antibiotics today from Jace Medical using using the code locked on at checkout at jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com. All right, let's go ahead and keep everything rolling here. Uh, for the everydayers, though, definitely want to uh, acknowledge all you guys that stick with me and really is awesome to be, be out of the preseason, be into the regular season here and uh, watching Ranger hockey, which I know we all just love to do. And uh, obviously some very passionate Ranger fans out there. For the everydayers, definitely stick around. Rangers back in action against Columbus on Saturday. Going to be back here with a new episode uh, after the conclusion of that game. Uh, and once again, thank you as always for making Locked On New York Rangers your first listen every day. Uh, to keep everything rolling here, want to turn our attention a little bit to some of the Ranger team defense that was played in this game, that the Ranger neutral zone play in this game. I already touched on it, describing um, you know the, the goal by Lafreniere and also to an extent the uh, goal by Artemi Panarin. But I thought that the the neutral zone play for the Rangers was awesome, and I got to give props to uh, MSG Network. They did a great job. They had kind of like a bird's eye view camera where you could kind of really see um, you know the way the Rangers were positioning themselves in the neutral zone. There was an instance in this game where. And it's one of those plays, it's not going to make like, you know, top 10 plays of the night in the NHL or anything along those lines. But it, to me, it was just a play that kind of summed up how this game went and how well the Rangers are playing defensively and specifically in the neutral zone. So you get this bird's eye cam review, you know, showing the replay and the Sabre defenseman had the puck and he wasn't really like under any pressure. Nobody was really on him. Nobody was really in his face or anything like that. But he just had, like, no idea what to do with the puck. He didn't know whether to skate it forward, try to get through the neutral zone himself. He was looking for somebody to pass to, couldn't find anybody. And then finally, he just kind of uh, threw a pass toward the center of the ice, and Mika Zibanejad got his stick on it, knocked it away. Rangers, you know, forced a turnover there, and they come away with the puck. And again, it, it's not one of those plays. It's like, oh, my God, best play of the month. But 
again, just kind of a microcosm, uh, a great example of how well the Rangers uh, played defensively in this game. And that was kind of par for the course. The Sabres couldn't get anything going. Uh, they had very few odd man rushes. I mean, maybe one or two here and there, but um, for the most part, Rangers kind of clogging up the neutral zone, just playing very well defensively. And it's just one of those games where it felt like the Rangers were in complete control. And part of the reason for that uh, was indeed their neutral zone play. So that was awesome to see um, the block shots. I, I You got to call this block shot factory 2.0. That was kind of my nickname back in the day when the Rangers had uh, Girardi and McDonough and Stahl. You can even throw Strawman in there a little bit too. Strawman doesn't get enough love. He, he's an underappreciated Ranger uh, in the last you know 20 or so years, however far you want to go back. But all those guys, they would always go down to the ice. They, they would block so many shots, and we saw a lot of that in this game here as well. Uh, Jacob Truba ended up with eight block shots in this game. Uh, Ryan Lindgren, he had he blocked two slap shots, I think, on the same shift. And, you know, he kind of hobbled to the bench, but uh, we all knew he was going right back out there because it's Ryan Lindgren. That's what he does. Um, there was also an instance, and we're going to talk about um, this five on three situation for the Sabres and the, the long power play that they had. We're we'll talking about that a little bit later in the episode as well. Um, but there was a five on three for, for a very short time there, 12 seconds and Truba blocked a couple of shots, uh, between the five on three and the five on four that ensued Truba blocked a couple of shots there and Nick Bonino, uh, he was wearing a couple as well. So, um, yeah, just good stuff all around and just great defensive play. And of course, uh, it also helps to have Igor Shesterkin in net as we are all keenly aware, uh, Igor, he wasn't really under too much fire the first two periods. I, I thought the first two periods, the one instance where, you know, he kind of faced a, a little bit of heat was actually um, during the four-on-four. Four. There was an instance in the first period where Kreider and, and somebody on Buffalo, they got matching minors during kind of a tussle um, after one of the plays. Um, so that kind of opened up the ice a little bit, um, which, you know, I mean, that that's really the only time in this, in this game in the first two periods where the Rangers... Felt like they gave up really any opportunities. And Igor Shesterkin was there. Uh, he fought off a tough one from Jeff Skinner during the four-on-four. Four. Um, so again, you know, four-on-four, four, the ice opens up a little bit. There's more chances for good scoring opportunities both ways. Sabres got at least a couple of there. Uh, but Igor was on top of his game, made the saves when he needed to, and uh, just did a great job with that. Uh, ends up stopping 24 of 25 shots, does Igor Shesterkin. And then there was the third period. And I thought this was actually maybe the Rangers... Uh, weakest of the three periods that's not really saying much they, they still played well and I mean hey if, if your worst period is a period where you outscore your opposition two to nothing as the Rangers did then that's obviously a good thing but there was kind of a you know a sequence here where you know, the Rangers they, they kept taking penalties they were they were back on their heels it was kind of where one penalty kind of led to the next penalty and Igor was great though um he had to start the third period shorthanded as the entire Ranger team did. And the Sabres, again, they kind of got some offense off of that. But Igor was big uh, during the penalty kills for the Rangers. And again, we're going to talk more about that, that five on three a little bit later in the episode. But I also want to mention uh, the goal that Igor Shesterkin gave up because even this, uh, there's not really anything that anybody could do on this play. This was just the result of bad luck. You had a situation where the Sabres carried the puck over the zone. Uh, Power takes a shot. Truba blocks it. And unfortunately, the puck basically lands right on the stick of Paterka, and he takes the shot, and he scores, he roofs it. That, at the time, cut the uh, Ranger lead down to 3-1. to one. So even the one goal that Igor Shesterkin gave up in this game, basically just a bad break. And, you know, it's funny because Truba, he did everything that, you know, you would want him to do on this play as well. Had great positioning, was willing to uh, wear the shot kind of in the shin there and blocked it. But I guess it's just kind of a situation where, you, know, you block eight shots sooner or later, one of them might go where you don't want it to go. And that was the case here. Like I said, I mean, it, it was, I mean, the Sabres scored credit where it's due. They all count and everything, but uh, the Rangers, even on the one goal they gave up, were playing outstanding defense. And again, just one of those situations where there's not really anything that anybody could do. Uh, the Rangers did a nice job against Devin Levy, which they were not able to do this past season. While we're talking about Igor, we might as well talk about the opposing goalie. Uh, Levi or, or Levi, Levi, I believe it is Levi. Uh, had only made seven career starts coming into this game, late round draft pick. Two of those starts were against the Rangers last year. And of course, he basically shut them down in both games, only allowing two goals uh, in each of those. So, you know, um, obviously it, it kind of goes back to the, the joke that we always make where, you know, anytime you get like an unheralded, unheard of goalie, they basically stand on their head and turn into prime Dominic Hasek against the Rangers, which is somewhat what Le Levi did last season, but uh, not so much in this one. The Rangers did a nice job against him. And I tweeted out 
uh, when I found out that Levi was going to be starting for the Sabres. Like, well, we already got uh, those games out of the way where kind of an unknown goalie goes off and, and, and stands on his head and just plays outstanding hockey against the Rangers. So we got that out of the way, and uh, Rangers were able to, to finally get to him. Third time was the charm as far as uh, playing Devon Levy is concerned. Um, as far as, you know, we're talking about the defense here. We're talking about Igor. Uh, the final shot block total in this game, because we've been talking about, you know, Bonino was blocking shots, Truba blocked eight shots, Lindgren obviously had a bunch of block shots as well. Uh, it was just awesome to see the Rangers doing this. The Rangers ended up blocking 23 shots in this game. The Sabres only put 25 shots on goal. So the Rangers almost had as many block shots as they had shots on goal allowed. So that's awesome. And again, props to Jacob Truba. Really happy he ended up with the empty net goal at the end of this game. He deserved it, blocking eight shots along the way. Um, it, like I said, it was one off of his career high of nine block shots in the same game, but you know, this is your captain and there he is out there setting a tone, wearing all these shots and, um, you know, just kind of leading the Rangers to a win, uh, good stuff there. Um, yeah, just, just great defensive play all around. And, uh, hopefully the Rangers can keep this up that they were very structured in this game, uh, great neutral zone play and going to keep everything rolling in just a second here. Want to uh, finally get to Chris Kreider having a big night. Two goals and an assist. So you know it was an awesome game when it takes this long. We're like 20 minutes into the episode here. I have barely even mentioned Chris Kreider. He had two goals and an assist. I mentioned Mika like once. He had three assists. So again, everything just firing on all cylinders and everybody playing strong hockey for the Rangers uh, in this game. So we're going to get to all that. Also want to point the spotlight at some of the new guys. I, I thought a lot of them made a really nice first impression in their first regular season game as New York Rangers. And like I said, we will get to that. But first, got to let everybody know that today's episode of Locked on New York Rangers is brought to you by Sleeper. The NHL season is finally here. Do the Rangers have the season that we've all been yearning for? I absolutely love the NHL, and I know you all do too. And that's why I want to tell you about the Sleeper app. The Sleeper app is the official daily fantasy app of the Locked on NHL Network, and it is my go-to for daily fantasy sports and especially daily fantasy hockey. With Sleeper, you can win 100 times your cash on Daily Fantasy. The NHL has never been more exciting than it is right now with studs like McDavid, Ovechkin, Panarin, Makar, etc. Just pick more or less on stats for these, star for these stars on stats like goals, assists, saves, plus, minus, and more. You heard me, Ranger fans. 100 times the payouts on Sleeper, so start paying attention and get your picks right, and you could win big. Use promo code Locked On NHL and you will get up to a one hundred dollar match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. That's Locked On NHL. See Sleepers' terms of use for details. All right, we just want to go ahead. And thank you guys as always for making Locked On New York Rangers your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. So I want to get to the new guys in just a second. But like I said, I've been trying to get to Chris Kreider the entire episode. Just a, a really nice opening night performance for him. Uh, you know, we've talked about a couple of the Ranger goals. We haven't gotten to this one yet. The Rangers score on their first power play opportunity of the season. Uh, they went one for four on the power play and the penalty kill did a great job for the Rangers too. You know, while we're on the subject of special teams here, uh, the Sabres went over three during their power play opportunities, including a really long one that had a 12 second, five on three, um, you know, advantage for the Sabres, but Kreider uh, first power play goal of the season for the Rangers Fox drew the penalty in the Ranger zone, actually. He kind of got pulled down to the ice. Uh, we got Trocek winning a face-off, which you guys know I'm big on face-off wins, and I don't think the Rangers ever gave up the puck after Trocek won this face-off. They went with the big five out there. You know, Trocek, Mika, Kreider, Panarin, Fox, the kind of standard five as far as the Ranger power play is concerned. And you've got Mika passing the puck over to Adam Fox. Fox kind of delayed with it. He's sort of in the center of the ice at the blue line, moves in and to his right a little bit, takes the shot, and Kreider is there with the tipping goal. Uh, there was some video that showed up on Twitter of Kreider working, kind of honing his craft as far as the tip-ins are concerned during the morning skate. And it's just crazy how effortless he makes this look. I mean, there's times where, you know, I think Ranger fans will, will say this of Kreider where it's like, you know, he's awesome at the tip-ins and that's great and everything, but you know, you'd like to see him kind of do some other things out there as well. You don't want him to just become one dimensional and just look for these tip ins. And I don't think Kreider's a one dimensional player at all, but even if this was the only thing that he could do for the Rangers, it's still incredibly valuable because he goes to the net and the shots on its way. And you show me, 
I've said this in the past. You show me anybody in hockey who is better than Chris Kreider at redirecting these shots into the net. I'll I'll wait for a while on that. I mean, there's some other good ones for sure. I know there's some love for for Joe Pavelski when it comes to um you know big time net front presences, and there's some other guys as well. But you know, for my money, Chris Kreider's the guy. He does this as well or better uh, than anybody in the league. I made it two nothing there, and then uh, ended up scoring a second goal while the Rangers were short handed. Uh, we'll talk about that goal in, in just a little bit here. I, I do eventually want to uh, talk about a sequence in the third period that was kind of wild. And um, this shorthanded goal came for the Rangers uh, right in the middle of that sequence. But for the time being, I want to shift our attention to the new guys on the New York Rangers. Uh, we are going to include Will Cooley here. And I realize Cooley was up with the Rangers last year, played in four games. But for all intents and purposes, you know, he's basically a new Ranger. Uh, and this will go down as his rookie season, assuming that he's with the team, you know, for the entire uh, season here. Um, but he had a really nice game. Uh, forced a turnover in the first period along the boards, and he's got going in on the four check, applying some pressure. Rangers came out with the puck due to Cooley kind of bearing down on his guy. Came close to scoring in the second period. You know, a really good hard shot from the left circle. It was kind of fought aside by Levi. Uh, you know, kind of a skate save, kick save. It was a good save. Um, Cooley you know, came pretty close to scoring in that opportunity there, or with that opportunity there. But he ends up with a game high. Four hits, was playing very physical. That was his one shot on goal, the one I just described. And he ends up with 12 minutes and 34 seconds of ice time. That was actually tied with Tyler Pitlick for the lowest amount of time on the ice for any player on the Rangers. Um, but that's okay. You know, he, he is just getting going in his NHL career. Better to, uh, you know, have him fresh for all of his shifts and not overwhelm him and not overload him early. Now, obviously... I mean, he looks like he's ready to go. He looks every bit the part of an NHL player. And if there's games where he's playing well, maybe some of the Rangers are not, I fully expect LaViolette to react to that and reward him with more ice time. But for the time being, and especially for this game when everybody was playing well, I'm totally fine with Will Cooley uh, being at or near the bottom of the list in terms of time on the ice. Uh, and really, 1234, you know, for somebody playing in the bottom six and for somebody who I don't believe was out there at all for special teams or at least very limited appearance on, on special teams, uh, that's not an insignificant amount of ice time. So that was great to see. You know, Will Cooley ends up uh, out there for a pretty solid amount. You know, we've seen uh, in other seasons, certain Rangers will be out there for like six minutes, seven minutes. Um, in this game, every, everybody got their chance. Everybody went out there. Had to be a pretty easy game as far as LaViolette, you know, coaching this game. Um, you know, there wasn't really a lot of like uh, tactical stuff that he had to do in this game because every Ranger player played well in this game. So he could just roll all four lines. He could roll all his defensemen and not really have to worry about it. Obviously, he had them ready to go and, and locked in and focused and uh, playing with some urgency and some structure in this game. But as far as like being a technician, being tactical, yeah, Laviolette really, really didn't have to do a whole lot of that in this game. And uh, that's evident by the you know, fairly comparable time on the ice that just about every Ranger had. You know, nobody was out there for just a couple of minutes. Everybody uh, got their chance and uh, played well when they had it. And uh, getting back to Will Cooley here, I like this too. There was a situation, Raiders at this point, I believe this was after the empty netter that they scored. Um, so yeah, it had to have been. So they're, they're up 5-1. There's about a minute left. Cooley put a hit on Ocposo and, you know, pretty good hit into the boards, clean hit and everything. But Ocposo was kind of mad and slashed him a little bit. Ended up getting a penalty, and it looked like Ocposo was maybe ready to throw down here. I actually kind of like the fact that Cooley just wasn't interested. Based on what the score was and where we were in this game, it's 5-1. to one. You've got in there. You've pretty much dominated. Why give this guy the satisfaction of getting into a fight with him? And we know Will Cooley is not afraid to fight. He proved that last year when he was up with the Rangers. Two fights in four games, won both of those fights. But I like this. Very mature. Just basically skated away from him. I don't even think he looked at him or said anything to him. Which, to me, that almost is cooler than throwing your gloves down there and winning the fight. You know, it's kind of just like, you know what, man? This isn't worth my time. We, we came in here and we dominated you. I have nothing to gain by doing this. Um, You can go sit in the penalty box for the rest of the game and we'll go ahead and skate out of here with a win. So I like that kind of non-response by Will Cooley there. And again, that's not like to say that he's afraid to fight. We know he's not. Um, But, you know, nice nice to see the maturity here and kind of the wisdom from Will Cooley, you know, just not uh, appeasing Akposa, who looked like he might have been ready to fight. I mean, I, I don't know that for sure, but it looks like he kind of had that look in his eyes. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Uh, Eric Gustafson, while we're talking about uh, Rangers making their debut, got to talk about him. Um, I tweeted this out last night. For somebody that's known as kind of an offensive defenseman, as Gustafson is, he's made some pretty good defensive plays, uh, both in the preseason and also in this game last night. There was one instance this uh, kind of got the attention of Igor Shesterkin. Um, Middlestat had a really good opportunity. He's going to the net, 
and uh, Gustafson was the last guy back. It almost looked like Gustafson might have been leaving the ice to go off for a change, but then realized he had to stay in the play and prevent the shot, you know, reach out with his stick, uh, disrupted the shot, the shot, uh, the puck goes up over the boards into the netting, out of play, play stoppage, and Igor, Igor noticed that. He took he took notice of that right away and kind of gave him a stick tap uh, after that happened. He was very appreciative of that play that Gustafson made there. Uh, Gustafson did take the first Ranger penalty of the season. Um, well, it was it was technically the second penalty, but Kreider had a matching minor uh, earlier in the game. So this is the first penalty that uh, resulted in a power play for the opposition. It looked a little bit ticky tacky, basically like threw a pick. You know, Braden Schneider was in the corner trying to fish out the puck from there in, in the Rangers side of the rink. And um, he's got a, a you know, four checking saber bearing down on him. And Gustafson kind of like accidentally on purpose got in the guy's way. Again, it doesn't look like much. And this is the kind of thing that like 10, 15, 20 years ago for sure probably would have never been called. Um, but technically it is interference. He got in his way. He knew what he was doing there, I think. So um, no issues with that penalty being called, even though it looked a little bit ticky tack. And there was a turnover by Gustafson in the first period that led to something of an opportunity for the Sabres. But um, overall, you know, I, I thought he played pretty well in this game. And uh, hopefully uh, hopefully him and Braden Schneider can get on the same page and they can click. Uh, I think they've overall looked good together when they've played together in this game, as well as the preseason. Um, so good stuff there from Gustafson. Blake Wheeler. Um, you know, he was out there with Cooley and Trocek. Uh, really good night for this line, I thought. They didn't create as much offense as some of the other Ranger lines, I don't think. Uh, in the third period, a couple more chances for this line than we saw in the first two. Um, but overall, just solid play. You know, it felt like, once again, like the second line, this line spent a ton of time in the offensive zone. You know, Laviolette has talked about wanting a shutdown line, and uh, I think the question could be posed, could this be the group here that kind of goes out there and um, obviously these guys, all three of them have some offensive skills for sure. Uh, but can they go out there and play sound defense and shut down the opposition in situations where that's what the Rangers need? It's possible. And it's possible. La Violette, uh, sees them in that light. Um, and, uh, with Wheeler, he ends up with exactly 15 minutes of ice time, minus one, two shots on goal. Uh, no Ranger forward. This goes back to what I was talking about earlier. No Ranger forward had less than 12 minutes and 34 seconds of ice time, and nobody had more than 1832. Trocek actually led the way with 1832. The next most ice time after that was Philip Heedle with 1545. So again, just a very good indicator of how well everybody on the Rangers was playing that you could just keep rolling these lines and uh, not really give it a second thought. So uh, Wheeler, you know, not like a eye-popping debut in terms of lighting up the, the score sheet or anything like that. But overall, I thought he was solid and I'm um, curious to see what that line can do going forward. Uh, Nick Bonino, he was making his Ranger debut as well. 75%. Win rate on the face-off circle. That's one of the reasons why the Rangers were interested in him. And I'm calling it now, that whole Rangers can't win more than half of their face-offs. They haven't done it since, I think, 2011, 2012. Uh, that dies this year. I'm calling it right now. Um, they, they've got some good face-off guys on this team. Trochik and Bonino are very good. Uh, Mika's solid. Hedo struggles there, but you hope that you know, with some good coaching, he can at least get a little bit better when it comes to face-off. But Bonino did well. Uh, was a minus one. Had a shot on goal. But he was blocking a lot of shots in this game. I mentioned the five-on-three where, you know, he was out there for the start of the five-on-three, which is impressive because in the five-on-three only lasted for 12 seconds. But, you know, you could go to Mika in that spot. Obviously, he's a trusted senior member of this team and a great penalty killer. You could maybe go to Barclay Goodrow in that spot. You're only going to have one forward on the ice, so you got to pick somebody that can win a faceoff. You could go with Goodrow. Uh, you go with Trocek for sure. No, they go with the new guy, Nick Bonino. So that tells me that uh, they really value him in that penalty killing role. And uh, it was a good night for the Ranger PK against a very dangerous Buffalo Sabre power play unit that I believe ranked third in the league last year. So Bonino already being trusted in that role to be one of the Ranger go-to uh, penalty killers. Uh, I had Tyler Pitlick. Um, you know, he had a big hit in the neutral zone. I want to say that was in the third period. Big clean hit, knocked his guy to the ice. Uh, he took a couple of hits early in this game when the physicality was picking up. I mean, very curious to see uh, how this goes between Pitlick and VZ. Uh, does VZ get in for the next game? Or does maybe even Bonino come out of the lineup, which I did not think would happen. But there was a tweet from Vince Mercagliano that it sounded like it came down to either Bonino or VZ being the odd man out for this game. It ends up being VZ. But very curious to see how the Rangers are going to uh, rotate their depth forwards. I, I hope VZ doesn't have to, like, you know, sit in the press box for the first five or six games of the season. I hope he gets out there eventually. I know these coaches don't like to, uh, you know, change too much with their lineup after a win, especially a win like this where everything clicks. Um, but again, I hope VZ doesn't have to 
you know, spend 60 games in the press box this season because he, he played well last season, and I think he deserves to at least mix in from time to time. So I want to talk about this crazy sequence in the third period, and I figure we can pretty much end with this. So Rangers, you know, third period, they are on a power play. Um, it ends up, you know, they get a couple of opportunities. Uh, Mika passing deep for Kreider, looking for another tipping goal for Kreider there. It went just wide. Uh, Trocek got a couple of chances on the doorstep. The second unit gets out there with 105 to go in the power play. And this is something else that I noticed on this game. To take a brief detour here, we talked about how last year, you know, the second power play unit, they would only be out there for like 30 seconds or 40 seconds, sometimes as little as 20 seconds in the power play. Tough to do a whole lot. One thing I was watching in this game uh, with the Rainier power plays, except for the first one, because they scored like, you know, 20 seconds into the power play. So you can't really uh, look at that one for this. But for the other three power plays that the Rangers got, it felt like the second unit was getting out there with like, you know, a minute 10 to go, a minute five to go, 55 seconds to go. So more of an even split. There could even be some situations where maybe the top unit starts the power play, second unit goes out there for a little while, and then the third unit is out there for, you know, the last handful of seconds on the power play. Um, but it feels like the second unit will get more of an opportunity. And I can't kill Gallant last year for always wanting to go with this top unit. It's a very dangerous unit, and he trusted those guys. Um, but it's good to see some other guys get some opportunities as well. And we saw that uh, Ranger second unit got some chances in this. But back to the sequence here. Uh, Hedl ended up having to take a penalty uh, with 28 seconds left, or 28 seconds into the Ranger power play. Uh, basically, he had the puck stolen from him. And the Sabres were about to go on an odd man rush the other way. And he'll kind of basically just tackle this guy, which after the turnover, I, I don't hate that because, you know, you're going to be four on four at that point. It probably beats uh, giving up the odd man rush, especially given your situation in the game up by two goals. So no issue. Uh, you know, the, the puck being stolen wasn't ideal for Hedl, but um, probably did the smart thing there, you know, kind of grabbing his guy and uh, not letting him get away for the odd man rush. Uh, so then, Long Buffalo power play, 133 left here for them. Uh, obviously not the full two minutes, but a good chunk of it. Uh, you get a couple of shot blocks by Ryan Lindgren here. Uh, and then Vincent Trocek takes a tripping penalty that he really probably didn't need to take. I mean, it was in the ranger zone, but the guy was along the boards. It's not like a, a great scoring opportunity was imminent here. So you get the five on three for 12 seconds, and the Rangers go Bonino, Truba, and Lindgren. Um, and Truba got, gets a couple of block shots. Uh, Bonino's blocking shots. Then it goes to a five on four. We get Skinner putting a shot off the crossbar and then lingering another block shot because, of course, and then Mika's advantage at shorthanded goes up the ice. Uh, they basically just kind of stormed out of the zone. You know, it was Mika and Kreider and Mika, just a phenomenal play here. He basically played the puck between the defenseman's stick and his skate and then got to it, you know, on the other side of the net there. And then, you know, he's running out of real estate. He can't really shoot at this point. So he passes back to the front of the net to Chris Kreider. And there he is for the tipping goal. And uh, that makes it four to one. And so the Sabres, after almost cutting the lead down to one, hitting the crossbar, um, the Rangers go the opposite way. They make it four one and they were well on their way to a victory uh, at that point. And then, you know, the Truba empty netter Rangers go up five to one. And that is indeed your final score. And uh, one last thought that I'll kind of leave you guys with here before we call it. So, the Rangers, I mentioned earlier, you know, is a complete team win. And I feel like Ranger fans have to be feeling good after this one, even though it is just one game. Can anyone point to a Ranger that had like a bad night or even like a subpar night? Everybody played well. This, this is exactly how you want to start the season. I don't think you really could have drawn it up uh, any better than the Rangers did here. So fear we can call it there. We've already kind of gone overtime, but hey, it's opening night. A lot of fun things happening in this game. I want to give shout outs to everybody on the Rangers that played well which again was basically everybody. I think I mentioned probably everybody at one time or another uh, in this episode. So uh, yeah, good stuff all around. And um, one last uh, thing I want to mention here, year number 40 for Sam Rosen behind the mic. So uh, big congratulations to Sam Rosen, one of the best to ever do it. And uh, for my money, the best uh, the best play-by-play -play man in, uh, in hockey right now. So good stuff all around. And uh, yeah, we could pretty much call it there. Definitely come back for the next episode. Rangers are at the Jackets on Saturday night. Uh, let's make it 2-0, and, and let's come back here and celebrate another win. But that will do it for today, guys. Once again, if you'd like to get in touch with this podcast, please send an email to LockedOnNYRangers at gmail.com. Once again, that is LockedOnNYRangers at gmail.com. Definitely give us a follow on Twitter as well, at LO underscore NY underscore Rangers. Once again, that is at LO underscore NY underscore Rangers. And definitely subscribe to Locked On New York Rangers YouTube channel. Thanks again, guys. I'll see you next time.